So welcome to the second MLFL of this fall. Uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, Pat Flaherty uh, from UMass Amherst. He's a professor in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. And uh, he received his uh, PhD in EECS from UC Berkeley and then went to Stanford uh, for, as a postdoctoral scholar uh, in the Department of Biochemistry. His uh, research interests are varies. Uh, it's pretty diverse, and it goes from machine learning to genomics, statistics, and genetics. And uh, his long-term research goal is to develop scalable statistical model to make sense of uh, large biomedical data sets. With that, Pat. OK, is this, can everyone hear me? OK, good. Um, well, thank you very much for, for coming today. Um, so uh, it was a great introduction. I don't have anything to add to that. Um, so <laughs> my background is, is varied. So as you said, I, I kind of am a statistician and, and, uh, by training. Um, and then I went and did a postdoc in biochemistry and genetics. And so that's, that's a big part of the research that I do and the approach that I take. So I, I hope you'll see that today. Um, I have a, a couple of goals um, with this talk. This is, uh, you're going to see kind of very preliminary data. So this is not kind of a polished end result, but um, it's very much a work in progress. And, um, and so kind of take that for, for, for the state uh, of what you're, you're about to see. Um, but there are many kind of different groups and, and people here. So, uh, so part of my goal is to kind of introduce you to this, this, the types of problems we try to solve in genetics and the, the ways that we try to solve them. If you're not kind of in that area, um, this, this area I find like just a gold mine for, for problems to work on kind of at the intersection of machine learning and statistics. Um, and, the things that, and the things that people do um, are, are by, by typically our standards, very rudimentary, and there's a lot of opportunities to do better. And if you do uh, do better, um, then you can make a real impact in kind of human health and, and our understanding of disease. So um, depending, however you come at this, uh, if this is not your primary research area, then I hope you'll learn something new, um, or at least uh, see something from a different perspective. Um, I'm going to kind of hit on all of these topics. Uh, I'm going to kind of start by just kind of introducing next generation sequencing, how the data is generated, uh, why that matters. Then I'll talk about some variant calling methods. Um, there are many of them out there, but, but these are the main ones. Um, you can th kind of think about that as a hypothesis testing. Uh, these are hypothesis testing models. Then I'm going to delve into generative models. There's a lot of research going on now about kind of discriminative models and generative adversarial networks and kind of thinking about that. Uh, and there's some really good literature from the kind of early 2000s that has a lot to say about generative and discriminative models. And if you're not aware of it, I want to kind of remind you of it and, and make you aware of it. It's kind of starting to get to be that like 10 years on. We kind of forget about this stuff, so I want to kind of refresh it. Uh, so, and then I'm going to talk about kind of what we've been doing in terms of simulating this type of data because um, we want to model the data, but there just isn't enough of it. So we need to build a simulator to help ourselves along and bootstrap this process uh, and the work that went into that. I'll talk about some existing methods, our model, and open problems and next steps. So. What is next generation sequencing? And this means different things to different people. So kind of the dictionary definition is reading nucleotides in a DNA molecule in order, right? So we've got this actual physical molecule. And the way that you can think of it is um, do uh, double-stranded DNA is like uncooked spaghetti. It's kind of like a polymer. It's, it's hard and relatively rigid if it's short enough. And single-stranded DNA is like cooked spaghetti. It kind of folds up on itself and things like that. And when it's inside of its cell, it can wrap uh, inside of itself. And I'm sure you've seen uh, pictures in, like, uh, in your biology texts of like, these bundles of DNA wrapped in histones and things like that. That's what we're thinking. And, um, and, but, but for the purposes of, of data, it's this linear polymer. It's this molecule. Uh, 
um, or this sequence made up of ACTG. So if you're used to text modeling or language modeling, your vocabulary is the alphabet from A to Z. My vocabulary, my alphabet is ACTG. Uh, and you can think of it that way. And I have no periods or any of those kinds of things. Um, the, another way to think about it is a platform for cost-effective, high-throughput biological assays. We, we did a lot of experiments on the bench that have now moved to the sequencer. So it's this, this kind of general purpose platform that we use to kind of like do a lot of different assays. One of them is sequencing uh, DNA, we can sequence RNA, we can look at methylation patterns, we can look at all of these different types of data using that instrument. Um, and then for our purposes here at the intersection, it's a source of massive data sets that we can use to build on our understanding of what happens when we get sick. So massive that um, the agencies that fund us don't understand how massive they are. So there's a big project called the Cancer Genome Atlas. And um, one of the big repositories that we use is called the Short Read Archive. And Cancer Genome Atlas said, we're running out of space in our data center. Would you help us? And the Short Read Archive people said, no problem. We can handle it. And TCGA started loading their data in. And the SRA people said, stop. <laughs> we, we need to find another solution. And they built a data center in Arizona just for the, the Cancer Genome Atlas project. So, uh, so there's a lot of data. Uh, and we're just scratching the surface of it. And it's all, uh, almost all of it's publicly available. The instruments that we use to generate this data, this is kind of the standard uh, thing that we all, this is a MySeq by Illumina. It's about the size of a tabletop. Um, those professors in the audience that are old enough remember computers that were like sitting on the tabletop, right? And this is what's coming out in the next few years, or is kind of promised, is a little USB device that plugs into your smartphone, right? So this is in the same way that we saw computers miniaturizing, we're seeing sequencers becoming miniaturized. And, and so this is not, not stopping. This has kind of all kinds of interesting applications. But the data that we generate here maybe look different than the data that we generate here. Um, uh, when I was a postdoc, I worked at a, a startup. Uh, it, it was one of these like typical Peter Thiel funded startups where everyone lived in a, uh, in, in a, like a mansion uh, in California. And they were working on kind of an instrument in the garage to do this type of thing. So, so the, there's all types of different people kind of working on this. And we have no idea where it's going to go, but we know that it's continuing. How does this work? How do we generate data? So uh, this is kind of your brief primer on sequencing by synthesis. So, the way that this works is we immobilize this like little DNA strand. So this is a piece of DNA on a glass slide. And it's very difficult to read a, a sequence of DNA. It's not like reading a text in a book where you can just look at it. Um, although people have tried using uh, kind of different microscopes and things like that. So what we do is we find that we can read it by synthesizing. So if you Kind of the, the analog is if I wanted to read a book, then I would read it by writing down each letter. And by writing down each letter, the act of writing allowed me to understand what I was seeing. Right? That's, that's what sequencing by synthesis is. So we flood the, 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 the cell with these uh, available nucleotides. And one will base pair with its complement. So A to T, C to G. And then those are labeled with a different color. So if it's a G here, it glows green. If it's an A, maybe it glows yellow. And if it's a T, it glows red and blue and so on. And then we wash away all the nucleotides, shine a laser on it, see what color it is, flood it with nucleotides, incorporate, shine, wash them away, flood it, and so on. So we're, we're basically incorporating a base reading it, incorporating a base, reading it. This is sequencing by synthesis. Image repeat. This is what the images look like. So when you look down um, in, at the flow cell, so in the first, in the first stage, you see a, a green dot. And then at the same position, you see a, a blue dot, red dot, green, and so on. And that allows you to kind of read this off. So this would be T, G, C, T, A, C. So, and there's millions of these dots on a, a, a microscope slide. Um, 
If this looks like a star field, if you were an astronomer, you're looking at a star field and, and all the stars are different colors and you're kind of looking for changes in luminosity, you would be correct. The first software that we used for doing this came from astronomy. We just kind of stole it and, and used it. Um, so this is, this is kind of how sequencing by synthesis works. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of this, this new uh, opportunity called single cell DNA sequencing. So typically, we take a whole bunch of cells, we extract their DNA, and then we sequence that. Um, but you lose something when you do that. You're, you're kind of looking at a population average. So imagine that everyone in this room is different, and I'm going to take uh, a cell from each of you and put them all together. And I'm going to say, uh, you know, what mutations are in this sample? And you would say, well, uh, that's a little bit strange to ask because each person is different and they might have different mutations. And so I would only gain visibility into the mutations that are really frequent among all of the people, right? Maybe like everyone in the room is smart and I hope to find the gene for smart people, right? And then, so that's, that's kind of what, we, what we've done or we sequence from blood and we, we make this assumption that everyone is the same. But some papers came out in the early 2010s that said, if you take a tumor from someone, the, the genotype at different points in the tumor are different. And that was very concerning, because we were just taking one sample from the tumor, and we were assuming it was all the same. And then we give somebody a chemotherapy based on the mutations that we see. Um, and, and I saw this in a clinical trial that I worked on uh, as a postdoc, where uh, we gave this person, it was a breast cancer trial, we gave this person a chemotherapy, um, and half the tumor disappeared, and the other half grew. Um, so we didn't quite get it. Um, and, and, but it means that, that there's heterogeneity in the sample. We want to try to understand that. So where the field moved was like, well, the best we could possibly do is take a single cell and sequence that single cell. And if we could do that, then we could look at all the mutations across the entire single cell. Some of them might occur. It might take two mutations, uh, one here and one here, to really cause the disease or have the effect that I'm observing. Um, so people have looked at tumor evolution by single cell sequencing, the human microbiome. This is your gut microbes by single cell sequencing. This is a, a haplotyping, so looking at both chromosomes. Um, and, and kind of this is where we are today. It's like we're, we're collecting a lot of this single cell data. There's a few challenges with this. It's expensive. So it costs about $3,000 for one of these experiments. And so if you want to collect 1,000 a, a cells, you're looking at a $3 million grant or trial, right? And, and that's just for sequencing. Um, so, so there's like people have these plots where they show a curve where you know, on one axis is the depth of sequencing, and then the other axis is uh, the number of cells, and there's like this Pareto curve, and it carves out basically the $1 million mark. Right? If, if you can sequence more cells, or you can sequence them with more resolution, but you can't do both, which just costs more money. That's, that's where we are today. That's where those technologies are coming in. Yeah? What's that cost curve look like with time? With time, that is super exponential declining, right? So the NIH collects this data. And so if you look at the cost per like megabase or whatever, um, it, on a log scale, it decreases faster than linear, right? So, so then you, you say to yourself like, OK, I've always believed in Moore's law and the exponential increase in the amount of computational power. But if the rate that you generate data per dollar is, uh, is increasing faster than exponential, then like Moore's law is not saving you, right? And so cost is, is kind of, uh, it's still a challenge, but, uh, but it, it's coming down, it's starting to flatten out now. And, and, and that's where these, these different technologies are coming in, they're, they're partitioning the market. Uh, whole genome amplification artifacts, and this is what I'll spend a lot of my time today talking about, is like dealing with these errors. We have a pretty good idea of how, wh what can go wrong, and we want to build models for kind of correcting for them and understanding them. And the third challenge is technical skill. Not a lot of people in the world can do this experiment. 
Um, many of them are, are at the Broad Institute at MIT. Some of them are at University of Washington. Uh, MD Anderson just hired a guy, and he brought a couple. This guy, Nicholas Naveen, um, and so there's only like you know three or four places around the country that can do this experiment. But everyone in the field is ramping up and, and gaining these technical skills. It will only be a few years before those people move on to different universities, and this will propagate. But right now, it's a limitation. Um, so it's. Slide is hard to see, but the little pictures are kind of what I want to draw your attention to. This is kind of like a high-level overview of what can go wrong. So what I'm interested in doing is I have this, I have a diploid genome. So this is my chromosomes. You can think of this as the DNA sequence. And this is a little mutation that I'm interested in finding, right? And if everything goes great, then I get to see both of these alleles are amplified, and I would see like uh, this mutation in the data that I actually get to observe. I'll show you an example of what the data looks like in just a minute. Um, but this, this is kind of the ideal situation, is I get to see both of these. Uh, in whole genome amplification, I have to kind of amplify off of this one molecule, right? So in this huge, imagine like this ocean uh, of water in this little tube that I have, and in there is one little molecule. And I want to amplify uh, the sequence off of that one little molecule. I'm going to make many, many copies of it. And if I don't copy it at that particular locus, it's lost forever, right? If I, if I don't amplify in the first round, then, then I might lose it. And that's what happens. We call that allelic dropout. So we have a 50% chance the, if you do have an allelic dropout event, you have a 50% chance the, the mutation is lost. You amplified off of this molecule, but not this one, or you amplified off of this one, but not this one. Uh, in this case, you would say there's two copies of the mutation, so you only amplified off of one of them, or you say there's only zero copies of the mutation. You completely lost it. You can introduce, uh, in this sequencing by synthesis, I can introduce an error. A base got misincorporated just by accident. Um, and in that case, uh, well, this is an entire locus loss. This is, uh, this is kind of a false positive, right? So I have a misincorporation. There's no single nucleotide uh, mutation here. And I introduced one just because of the amplification process. And all of a sudden, it's there. So this is a false positive. Um, and there's other issues, but these are the kind of two of the main ones that I'm going to focus on. So at the end of the day, what do I get? Uh, or what am I interested in kind of outputting? And the answer is a read count matrix. So here the rows are samples. So this is, imagine I have three single cells. And the columns are the bases. Again, this is my, my alphabet, A, C, G, T. And the possible genotypes that are in that sample at that particular position, uh, this is diploid, so it's either AA, it could be AC, AG, AT, CC. These are unordered pairs of these four nucleotides. There's 10 possibilities, right? So I want to I be able to tell you, based on this data, what the genotype that gave rise to this read count is. So in this case, in sample one, I only saw Cs. So you would say, well, the most likely genotype that gave rise to that is probably CC, right? Or if I saw 10 A's and 10 C's, then this genotype says half of the, the bases are A's and half of the bases are C's. Here, it's a little more confusing, right? I see 12 A's and 17 C's. So is this? CC? Is it AC? Like, are there errors in here? Is there uh, a mixture? So is it 50% AA and 50% CC and so on? So, so here's, here's uh, the data that I get to observe, and here's the thing that I want to know more about. Um, OK, any questions about that? I've kind of given you a whirlwind primer of next generation sequencing leading to the types of data that I'm going to be dealing with. 
So the variant calling problem is, is kind of this pipeline that we use in bioinformatics. And, and the goal is, at the end of the day, to make clinical interpretation and decision making for diagnostics and therapeutics. But there's a long pipeline that, that gets me there. And whenever you read one of these papers, you'll say, OK, there's a huge method section. And these are all the data processing steps that, that it took me to get there. Um, I'm focusing on this step right here, variant calling. So I want to be able to say, yes, there is a mutation at this position in the genome, or no, there is no mutation at this position in the genome. So, uh, but it fits into this, this much larger scheme of, um, uh, of, of, of calling algorithms. And this is the picture that I want you to keep in your head kind of as I talk for the rest of this, uh, uh, for the rest of this time. Um, so imagine that you have a, a solid tumor that looks like this. So this is the outline of this solid tumor. Uh, maybe it's a liver tumor, or it's a, a breast cancer tumor, or so, some not leukemia, which is a liquid tumor. Um, and there are different regions of this tumor. And these different regions arise because maybe a single cell at some point back in its history, a single cell gained a growth advantage. And it started growing faster and faster and faster and started making more copies of itself. And that leads to a region that looks like this of uh, cells that are all genetically similar to each other. And a different region here, and a different region here outlined by these, these dotted lines. And, but I don't get to see the boundaries of those regions. But I do get to take samples from this tumor. And uh, bulk samples are like if I took a needle and went down and grabbed like a, a little cylinder of cells, and then I took the DNA from all of those cells and then process them. So I would have millions of cells um, to, to get DNA from. And here, the bulk sample would encompass this region. Here, the bulk sample kind of overlaps a few regions. And here, the bulk sample overlaps a few regions. And then I also get single cell samples. So I get to take these. And obviously, they can only come from basically one region because you can't have a mixture in a single cell, it's one genotype. Um, so, so this is this is the data that I'm uh, the data set that I'm I'm collecting, and I'm interested in answering questions about what's the genotype of the entire sample. Um, and, and if you're kind of thinking ahead, you're thinking about well, there's maybe an admixture here, and there's an admixture over this whole thing, and that's the type of model that that we're interested in kind of like constructing. I'm going to define a little bit of notation to start with. So uh, the number of genome positions that I'm interested in is this length, the count of the number of samples. So that was the number of squares and circles. Uh, the number of reads at a position i in sample j. So in my read count matrix, I got to see a particular position in sample 1 20 times. So it's the sum of that row. Um, the set of possible genotypes. Again, this is, there's 10 of these. The true genotype at position i in sample j, this is kind of the thing that I'm really interested in. Um, and then the observed DNA base at site i. So this is at site i in sample j in read k. Uh, and this is one of my little alphabet here. I'll talk about these later. So there's a couple of models. And these graphical models, if you're, if you're not familiar, how many of you are familiar with graphical models? Let me just give you, OK, so I'll give a brief primer on graphical model structures. These, do, these appear nowhere in any paper in genomics that I've seen, right? Like, you have to read their method section. Um, again, I want to kind of point out that this area is ripe for research. Uh, sometimes their dense distribution functions, their, their probably density functions, don't sum to one. Um, so, so the bar is low <laughs> if you'd like to join us and contribute. So, so these models, I, I drew these models myself after like reading the papers and trying to understand what they're really trying to do. So uh, this is one of the most famous kind of standard models. Can someone uh, close that? Thank you. This is kind of one of the most uh, famous. This is one that people use all the time. Um, and, and what it says is, OK, uh, G, which is my genotype, can be one of three numbers. It can be 0, 1, or 2. And if it's 0, there's no variant there. If it's 1, there, it's like AC, and the, ba the reference base is A, and there's a, a C that's different. 
And if it's two, that means there's two Cs. It's, it's different on two, you know, two of them, and it's a diploid. So I'm going to draw from a binomial uh, over one, 0, 1, 2 uh, for each sample, uh, and that's this G. And then condition on that, I'm going to flip a coin. And like, let's say I say the genotype is AC. And I flip a coin and I say, OK, if it comes up heads, I'm going to say A. And if it comes up tails, I'm going to say C. And I do that over and over and over again. I do it like 20 times. And, and that's the data that I get to observe. So if it's AC and I flip the coin, maybe 50% of the time I get A and 50% of the time I get C, I'll get 10 A's and 10 C's. And, and that's, that's their model. Um, and then halfway through the paper, they say, uh, we don't really like that model. We like this model better. And, and here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to just put a prior distribution on this random variable we'll call x. And then we'll draw y condition on x. And it's going to be this binomial. Um, and x is across n samples how many times you saw a variant. So let me kind of fix these ideas. So, if I said um, you have 10 samples, and each one of those samples can have 0, 1, or 2, right? So uh, the maximum number that you could get out of that is 20, 2 times, two times 10, right? Um, and and so, so x is drawn from some prior distribution over the numbers from 0 to 20. Um, but really what they're doing is here they're, they're kind of rolling this uh, this little m-sided die, right? But they're rolling it n times. So imagine I'm playing Yahtzee, right? So I roll one die, I roll another die, I roll another die, I roll five dice, right? And then I add up the numbers that I see on the dice. That's each one of those dice is g. Or I roll five dice all at the same time and report to you the sum. That's x. They're essentially doing the same thing, except this model lets me put whatever prior I want on that. And this model restricts me to a prior that kind of depends on this theta. And that's, that's the trick behind this model, is they, they play this game uh, where they, they allow this to be kind of whatever they want. The, your list, what was the epsilon? epsilon is the probability that I make a mistake. Right? So, so I flip that coin, and the coin comes up heads, right? or the coin comes up A. Um, and then the epsilon says, well, even though it came up A, I'm going to tell you T. So imagine that you have like an observer who's watching the coin flip, but every once in a while, the observer lies to you. Right? And that's the epsilon. That's your read error. So, so at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're building up kind of our belief about how this experimental system works. And we're incorporating these different errors. Uh, and we build up this model. Uh, this model, SNV, Sniver, says, uh, well, we really like the BCF tools model, but I want to put a binomial distribution there. Fine. Right? And that's, this is a paper. Um, so <laughs> Uh, Monovar is, is one of the only models that actually tries to look at single cell sequencing data. So right now, uh, I think there's like two out there, and this is one of them. So this has some, some kind of cool structures. Uh, or let me back up. So each one of these nodes is a random variable. Uh, edge between random variables means there's a conditional probability distribution function of this random variable that's a function of this. And a plate means replication. So I'm not going to belabor this because it's, it's not germane to kind of my main point of this presentation, but we'll come back to it. Um, so they say, well, I want this x random variable here. And I'm going to draw the genotype from a multivariate hypergeometric distribution. They have good reasons for choosing a multivariate hypergeometric distribution. But here's where kind of the interesting stuff happens. So they say, I'm going to instantiate this random variable z, which is the probability of this allelic dropout event. Right? So with some probability, I have an allelic dropout event. And we'll call that pz. And then if there is an allelic dropout event, 
then I'm going to draw from like a categorical random variable where it's either AA or C. So let's say the true genotype is AC. I'm going to draw and say, well, it's, it's either AA or CC, but not AC. And that's how they model an allelic dropout. And if it, they didn't have an allelic dropout, then it's this categorical with that original genotype. And that's the observed, and I get an observed base from that. And so if you look at this structure here, if you just kind of zoom in on this, this is conditional regression, right? So all we're doing is we're saying, or un, I guess unconditional regression, we're just kind of plotting two lines, uh, one for z equals one, one for z equals zero, and, and other than that, it's just, it's just straightforward regression, right? So you can see like graphical model structures that you've seen before, um, because I've drawn the graphical model, but it kind of in the paper, this is, this is the types of things. It, by the way, they don't call things categorical, Bernoulli, or hypergeometric. They just write things down. Um, so so then, then, then I draw a base uh, from that, pro from the probability that I get from here, and kind of I go around. And again, kind of to Marcos's question, so this is the base that was really there in the DNA molecule. And this is the base that my sequencer reported to me. And they, they may not be the same. My sequencer may make an error when it's reading it and telling me what the answer is. This is state of the art. So this is, this is kind of, if you want to do single cell variant calling, this is what you use. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the allelic dropout really only affects you for a heterozygous allele, yeah. Um, so it, it's kind of built in. It's when G is one that it's a heterozygous. The true genotype is heterozygous. When G is two, it's homozygous variant. And when G is zero, it's homozygous reference. Um, so I'm going to diverge a little bit and talk a little bit about generative models. So there's a lot of, of research going on now. Many of you are probably working on uh, like deep learning model. How many of you are like really interested in deep learning models and stuff like that? Many of you, okay. Are you, do you teach the, yeah, so <laughs> you can't say no. <laughs> so it's a little more agnostic about, so the, so I'm going to talk a little bit about generative models. So um, just to kind of, because you have a choice. Um, discriminative models are very popular today because they work really well, right? Um, so here's the framework. Suppose we have inputs X and labels Y, and in our case, the input is our observed data matrix, that read count matrix that I saw, and the label Y is whether there's a variant or no variant to that position, right? So if I were a discriminative person, then I would say, well, all I really care about, you're going to give me this read count matrix, and all I need to do is tell you whether there's a variant there or not, right? Like, that's, that's the goal. Um, so just do that. And don't worry about trying to understand allelic dropout or false positives or what the underlying genotype is or any of that, because it doesn't matter. That's not what your goal is. Uh, so, Logistic regression, random forest, neural deep network, support vector machines, these are all like, yeah. Uh, but in your data, you don't have any labels. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining okay. that I have, yeah. <laughs> so imagine I gave you data with labels, uh, yeah. So, so that's what you would do, right? Yeah, good point. Um, uh, you, you could make the argument that I could give you a label, okay. So, it, it, but in a generative model, you say, I want to model the joint distribution, and, I, and then so you model the likelihood. You say, given that I have a variant here, so all that stuff that I just described for you was in the generative model framework. I said, here you generate a variant, and then condition on that variant, here's how you generate data, right? And, and your question was, you know, what if it's, if it's heterozygous or homozygous, what does your read count matrix look like? All that focuses on this likelihood, and then I get to put a prior, the PY of the probability that I ever saw a variant. That's what the difference between the BCF tools and the Sniver model was. They were saying, we have different priors about what the probability of a variant is, and we're going to choose uh, different things. So mixture models, hidden Markov models, latent durational allocation, Gaussian process models. These are all kind of generally in the, in the generative model framework. So why would you choose discriminative models? And there's, so this is where I'm dredging up. Is this, is this like a well-known paper or is this, uh, yeah. So, okay, so why would you choose, it's not well-known to everyone. 
So, so I'm going to. So, why would you choose a discriminative model? Because there's a paper that said that they're always better, right? Or almost always better. The paper was not quite that. Or almost always preferred, right? So it says. Um, so this is at a time when support vector machines were very popular. We can replace that with deep learning. Um, and they say that the, these discriminative classifiers always do better if you have a ton of data, right? They have a lower asymptotic error. Um, but a generative classifier may also approach its higher asymptotic error rate faster. So what the take home message from this research, and I'll show a few more papers, is, is like it kind of matters on, it depends on how much data you have. That's kind of one of the, the take homes from this. Uh, there are other reasons that you would want to choose a, a generative model. So one is you handle missing data naturally, right? So, so I can kind of fill in the missing data. Um, I can encode my beliefs about the data generation process in, in, in kind of the, the area that I am, which is kind of in between kind of statistics, machine learning, and, 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 and genetics, this matters a lot, right? So I can sit down with, with my genetics colleagues, and I can say, well, I'm going to instantiate this model. And it encodes my, in a very concrete way, my belief about how this process is going to work. And then we, we can discuss and argue about whether that's the right model for the situation. Um, but it gives us a substrate for those conversations. And, and it requires me to kind of like pin it down. Other reasons are if you're like philosophically tied to one method or another, then discriminative models or generative models are kind of the way to go. Um, and then there's not enough data to justify a discriminative model. And this is kind of the regime. I, I find for, for a few of these reasons that I, I'm leaning towards generative models for this particular task. So I'm going to, because uh, uh, this is kind of cross-disciplinary, this is a, an example of a generative model that you would never read about in like a NIPS journal, right? Uh, but, it, but it exists, right? So this was published in 1998. And so these people sat down and they said, OK, this lambda phage, this little virus, can do one of two things. It can integrate itself into the chromosome and hide out, and then your immune system or the actually the bacteria's immune system, can't kill it. Or it can make more of itself and lyse the cell and then, and then propagate and things like that. And people realize very early on that it has like this stochastic switch where it like makes this decision. It has hysteresis. It has these really cool properties and it's, it's optimized because viruses have been under evolutionary pressure for eons and eons. So how does this work? So they wrote down this what looks like very comp and it is a very complicated model, but uh, this is kind of the gold standard for for kind of like this this uh, this developmental pathway, um, and each one of these steps has a particular probability distribution. It's usually like an exponential waiting time, things like that. This is a perfectly good generative model, and it gives us insights into the science and biology. I can take this model and I can do an experiment. I can knock out a gene, and I can ask the model. What should the data look like, and it will tell me. Right? So yeah. 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 It's a, it uses Gillespie. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not only generative, it's exactly. It's really, yeah. really powerful, right? Uh, so, so, so this is yeah. Exactly. And they did experiments, and they, they showed that it were uh, agonizingly difficult to build, but very powerful when you do build it because you're able to do real science. Um, uh, not that we don't do real science here, but you know. So, <laughs> so uh, more recently, uh, Steven Strogatz and, and some colleagues uh, sat down and tried to look at the New York taxi ride sharing model, right? So they, they again, built this generative model. It's, it, again, kind of articulates uh, how people share taxi rides. And th the crux of it is if we're correct, then the model should fit the data. And also, we can, have, we can make policy suggestions. So if I give you a generative model, then I can tweak parameters in the model. I can tweak structures in the model. And I can say, OK, if you make this policy change, this is what I expect to happen as a result. Right? So this is, this is very powerful. Um, so there are a lot of commentary on this article. And they said, you know, great, you mathematician. 
no one will ever do that in real life, right? Which, which is, so, so you're gonna run into this, like, uh, this argument sometimes, but it still uh, it, it holds a lot of weight because, um, so the, I guess like the, the people who drove taxis were like, we're not gonna subscribe to this, like, you know, we're gonna do what we wanna do and, and so on. But, but it's still a very powerful kind of way of, of analyzing these types of data sets. Um, I can't leave this room without mentioning hybrid models. Um, because, like, uh, uh, because people here worked on them. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, exploiting generative models. So, so very quickly after this, this paper came out, uh, people said, well, oh, you know, why not combine the best of both worlds? Shouldn't you be able to do a little bit of, can't you, you know, take some of your variables and model them discriminatively and take other variables and model them? generatively, and, and the answer is yes, you get some benefits of it. Um, I, I find this really interesting because like I, you know, the current literature is around GANs and variational autoencoders and discriminative neural networks, and I feel like we're kind of revisiting this in a slightly different way, right? And it's like, oh yeah, discriminative and generative models can be really powerful. Yes. You know, this is, um, so, so if you haven't read these papers, then, then uh, you know, Go and dig them up. Okay, so I'm going to describe uh, kind of the first preliminary data that we have. So this is, we needed to build a simulator. As I talked about, there's a, you know three thousand dollars per sample, technical expertise, uh, and so on. So it's really hard to get your hands on this data. And even if you could get your hands on the data, you don't know where the true variants are. So when you're in that situation, you have to build a simulator. And it's very easy to sit down and say, well, I have this, I'm going to build a generative graphical model, so why don't I just generate data from my generative graphical model? And the reason that we don't do that is because it's kind of cheating, right? It's saying, like, if I can generate data from my model, and then I can do inference on the same model, then it looks great, right? So we build a separate simulator that we can argue about and, and improve and we think represents reality, and then we build a model uh, independently of that. So this is the first step. We, we need to build a model. Oops. Yeah. And the simulator is, has a different structure, a different uh, sort of underlying formalism? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, there's, some, there's some overlap, right? But, but we're going to kind of like build it independently. It's that we're not just going to generate data from our model. Right? Um, uh, and there's, so there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the main one is I showed you that at the end of the day I want that read count matrix, right? None of my like competing methods take a read count matrix. They take these fast Q files. So I have to build a simulator that's going to generate fast Q files. And I need to generate them in a way that, uh, and other people have developed uh, kind of components to this simulator that I can build upon that, that do certain things better than I could do on my own. Um, so it has to do these things. Um, it has to simulate these mutations. It has to simulate whole genome amplification errors. It has to simulate sequencing errors. And it must produce this fast Q file so they can be aligned to a reference and plug into my standard next generation sequencing pipeline. Um, the people who did the Monovar paper made a simulator, and they didn't share it. They said, they said, we made one, and, and our code is available on GitHub, but it's not. Uh, and then you go there, and there's an exe file. And, uh, <laughs> I, I'm preaching to the choir on this. <laughs> so, so, in order to, so first thing we need to do is simulate a single nucleotide variant. And here, um, what kind of single nucleotide variant? So once I say that this position is going to have a mutation, well, if that position in the reference genome is AA, then it can either convert to an AC, AT, GG. What does it convert to? And we've done a lot of measurements over the years on a lot of genomes, and we know the rate of transitions and transversions. We know the probability that you, given that you have a transversion, you generate an, uh, uh, an AG to a CT and so on. And these generate homozygous SNPs, heterozygous SNPs, and so on. So, so we took this component and plugged it into our next generation sequencing simulator. 
Um, and then we need to generate allelic dropouts. So we have to sit down and say, okay, what's the probability of an allelic dropout? What's the probability uh, of an entire locus dropping out? Imbalanced amplification. So we went through and kind of like built little uh, probabilistic models for these components um, and plugged those into our simulator. We need to simulate false positives, and those have a certain rate that we know of. So I'm kind of like going to that, that genetics paper and saying, we know these parameters, we're going to plug them in, and we're just going to build this simulator. So at the end of the day, this is what our data set looks like. This is from a program called IGV. And here's a mutation. So all of these gray bars are the no, kind of height of the number of reads. So maybe I have 30 reads, 29, and so on. And then this position says, it's heterozygous. So G is uh, orange, and I think like C is blue. So here it says about half of the reads that I saw were C, and half of the reads are G. And, and so this is, so now I can generate as much ground truth data as I want, whenever I want. And I'll evaluate some existing methods. So I simulated 10 single cells. Oh, and I should say this work was done with a graduate student of mine, Hashem. Um, I simulated 10 single cells, 100 megabases, with 1,000 single nucleotide variant positions. A third of them are present in all the cells. A third of them are present in half the cells. And the remaining are a random fraction. I just drew from a, a uniform distribution. Um, so here are the results. If you plug this into BCF tools, there, there's uh, like 5,835 true variants. Um, and so BCF tools missed 231 of them, and it called 1,000 extra ones that weren't there, giving it a sensitivity of 0.96 and a precision of 0.83. I used default parameters for everything. Usually, there's a default parameter, which is a threshold in almost all of these models. I can't think of one that doesn't have this, where they say, uh, this number is 0.05. Whether that thing is really a p-value is, is usually totally fiction. Um, but but the, they kind of like give you this imprimatur that there is a p-value underlying it. Um, BCF tools has a posterior kind of distribution. Monobar does have a, a p-value. Um, they have, so I set that at 0.05, that's the recommended value. So if you believe that it's a p-value and it's kind of a Bayesian version of a p-value, then the number of false positives that I should see is 5%. And the number of false positives that I do see is 50%, right? Or the precision is 50%. So like this is a big problem because I called, I don't know, uh, you know, whether, I don't know which ones are really true and which ones are really false unless I have this other dimension of the table. So Monovar tells me there's 10,000 true variants out there, only half of which are real um, in reality. So, so this is kind of the problem that, that we're trying to tackle right now is um, these models are not well calibrated. Um, so if I, I'm missing an I here, I guess. So these models are not well calibrated, and if I, if I tell you I get a false positive rate of 0.05, I want to actually give you a false positive rate of 0.05. I want to have some control over that. Is that wrong? We're investigating, right? So, so where is it making those errors, right? Is it making those errors when the single nucleotide polymorphisms are rare, so they're only in like one sample, um, but it's when they're in all of the samples, it's getting it right, and stuff like that. So, so yeah, it's, it's kind of unclear where exactly it's making that, that error. Uh, yeah, but what, what I'm not showing is there's a ton of these, right? So it's, it's a million times 10, you know, minus whatever. So, so there, it's, it's it's not calling a whole bunch of stuff. I'm trying to understand what this, so you're talking about type 1 errors is what the 0.5 should be. Yeah. Uh, sorry, and isn't that the false column? That, that, so we're getting 5,000, but, but that's out of a massive number of actual. Right, right. 
uh, it's, it's not. It's, it's, it's not. <laughs> I see what you're saying. Um, so w what are we going to do? So, so our model looks like this. So we, we've built this model. Um, so we have the key components are I really want to use, so if you remember that tumor picture that I showed you, I want to use information from the bulk and from the single cells. I want to use both. And so how do I do that? Well, I'm going to build a, single, a model that I believe is a generative model for single cell data. That includes whole genome amplification. I'm going to build a model for bulk data. And I'm going to put a prior on top of that that ties these two things together. In my case, I'm going to use a Dirichlet process as a prior. And I'll describe why. So I'm, I'm kind of modularizing my model. So now I've got single cell model, bulk model, and prior that ties the two things together. So here's the generative process. So for each sample, whether it's bulk or single cell, I'm going to draw a distribution over genotypes. And this is, this is kind of one of the keys to, to this model that's different from any other model out there. So we typically say the genotype is this, right? That's kind of like a categorical variable. It's, it's either AC or AG or whatever. But I'm going to relax that, and I'm going to say I'm going to choose a distribution over genotypes. And the, the one hot vector is a perfectly good distribution. Um, and if a single cell sample draw the genotype for the whole genome amplification process, and then for each read K, draw an intermediate true base, and then draw an observed base. So here I'm kind of drawing this, this distribution over genotypes. And then if it's a single cell, I pass it through this whole genome amplification process. I say the true base that I would have observed, the one that's actually in the sample, is B. But my sequencer, which is my kind of unreliable reporter, tells me D. Um, so the model for the, the bulk uh, looks like this. So the distribution over genotypes, the bulk samples are millions of cells. So we really can't talk about the, the genotype of a sample because it's comprised of all of these cells. And it's heterogeneous. Um, we often make this simplifying assumption. All of those previous models make this assumption that of genetic homogeneity. But that's just not the case when I have millions of cells and it's this tumor sample. Uh, and it's certainly not the case for human microbiome or environmental samples. So we're going to model it as a distribution over genotypes, relaxation. Um, the intermediate base gives me a, a, a dis another distribution over genotypes. Uh, and then the observed base is, is my uh, kind of unreliable report. Um, for the single cell data, you would say, well, there is one genotype, right? It's the genotype of the single cell. And so we're going to justify this by saying, well, it represents my uncertainty about the true genotype, right? So it's, it's perfectly fine to go in and say, well, um, I know that there's one genotype in there, but I'm going to still model it as a distribution because it captures that situation where there is one. But it, it kind of essentially models my uncertainty about that, um, that, that true genotype. And this modeling choice uh, has con inferential conveniences because it allows us to use the same type of random variable for bulk and single cell. Right? So I can put a prior on both of them, and the, the, the next step is always going to be the same. Uh, my whole genome amplification model looks like this. I'm going to skip by this because it's, it's kind of, um, uh, you can think of a state transition model. right? So Again, I'm, I'm kind of modularizing my model. I can, I can kind of build these different chunks and move them in and out and talk with my genetics colleagues and say, OK, I want this to be different, or this doesn't make sense for this reason. It's a substrate for model refinement and criticism. Um, so the non-parametric Dirichlet process allows us to choose the, the same uh, distribution over genotypes for multiple samples. So the picture that you can have in your head is like a, a triangle, right? Your classic simplex, right? So at one point of the triangle for a particular position is like AA. And then another uh, vertex is AT and then TT. So a particular genotype of a sample is a dot in that simplex, right? So if it's at the corner, you get one geno, you know, you get the one hot vector. But it's, if it's in the middle, then I'm I don't know whether it's AA, AT, or TT. Um, and the Dirichlet process allows me to choose that same point over and over and over again if I, if I want to. Um, 
uh, or it, it allows it to draw that same point. If I just drew from a Dirichlet, then with, uh, with almost surely I would not choose the same genotype. And that allows me to cluster uh, samples, right? And if you remember that tumor example had these different regions, and I want to be able to cluster genotypes. And those clusters correspond very naturally to the regions of the tumor. Um, I use a Metropolis Hastings kind of posterior sampling, and this is where people get, uh, I, I kind of run into a little bit of confusion sometimes because I say, well, uh, I have this really nice conjugacy. I have like a Dirichlet multinomial going on here, and they're like, great, posterior sampling, Gibbs sampling, it's conjugate. It's not. Uh, I have this annoying T matrix hitting, uh, hit, hitting the inside of my, uh, multinomial. So it's not conjugate. I have to use Metropolis Hastings, but Metropolis Hastings works pretty well, as I'll show you. Just a minute. Um, and then I'm not going to say very much about Metropolis Hastings Dirichlet process sampling. I just use Radford Neal's auxiliary sampler. So you just, it's just like 10 lines of Python, and you can implement his little sampler. It works really well, in my experience. Um, so this is, I, I kind of, this is my little read count matrix. One example, this is your classic trace of your Metropolis Hastings samples. So it looks like it's mixing pretty well. Um, there are other metrics. We've run a bunch of metrics through it, but it kind of tends to all look the same. Um, and then these are histograms for posterior distributions. And I know that the truth is the AA is 80% and the TT is about 20%, and it's kind of capturing that. So, so we get good kind of results out of, out of this type of model at least for that, for that step of the model. There's, so I'm going to leave you with this one annoying thing about my Dirichlet process model. So the posterior for K is inconsistent. What does that mean? So when I use the Dirichlet process, and when we, we argue typically about the Dirichlet process, we say, uh, the posterior is consistent, right? If, if I give you enough data, it will fit any distribution that you give me. With the, I'm, I'm, I'm glossing over a whole bunch of assumptions and conditions, but let's just say that that's the case, right? So think of your typical like distribution function that starts at zero and goes to one, and it does something kind of interesting in between, but it's monotonically increasing. The Dirichlet process, given enough data, should kind of like you know, in L1 distance, get very close to that true distribution function. Um, however, which is great if you're doing prediction. Uh, however, if you're trying to estimate the true number of clusters, it's inconsistent. And in fact, these people published in NIPS a couple of years ago that it can be really severely inconsistent. Uh, and people see this a lot when they run Dirichlet process models. So if you truly have two clusters, the Dirichlet process will say you have 10, and the maximum, the maximum A posterior is 10. And that's a problem for us kind of in this field because like, we want to know how many different clusters of genotypes there are. Should I give people two drugs or four drugs? The way that the Dirichlet process kind of does it, it goes, goes wrong, is it starts assigning clusters to singleton data points. Um, so there's some research that just came out this year and last year that uh, try to fix this problem, and they have consistency results on K, the number of clusters. Uh, repulsive Gaussian, Gaussian process mixtures, uh, mixture of finite mixtures was done by these guys. Um, so, so this is kind of uh, one of the directions that we're thinking about modifying this model, because we really do care about the total number of clusters. Um, that is it for me. So any questions? Thank you for coming. It couldn't, it couldn't be there, yeah. 
Yeah. So so you could you could kind of so you could kind of uh, you know carve out certain genotypes and say I couldn't see this, but in a sense that would require you to a priori know that that mutation is deleterious or or lethal, right? And for many mutations, we don't know which are the lethal mutations. We can we have prediction algorithms that will tell us like that that one is probably bad, and if you are like a protein biochemist, then you know that substituting this protein for this protein is probably going to be bad. But, um, but it's very difficult to say a priori that that mutation will never happen. Yeah, good question. Anything else? Yeah, so, uh, so the, the way that you can't publish a paper without doing is generating your own data, right? So sequence a bunch of single cells and run your model on those single cells and see what it gives you, right? And then go in, what we, what we often do is like if we're working on bacteria, right? Um, and I say this mutation um, causes this bacteria to live better in this uh, antibiotic, right? So this, this mutation causes resistance to this antibiotic. Um, and I can go in and make that mutation in that bacteria and do the experiment and say, oh yeah, the mutation that I thought did, had the effect does have the effect in isolation on its own. Exactly, so there's feedback like you can then go back to the Exactly. That's right, a different experiment. Anything else? Okay, thank you. <laughs>